I'm uh, very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm also sorry that Professor Huawei Fong wasn't allowed to join us, but I'm confident that the discussion uh, will warrant your attention. Uh, I'm going to introduce this program about uh, uh, legal and constitutional reforms and their prospects in China. Uh, first, by pointing out that this is not only a domestic problem for China. Both internationally and domestically, the Chinese government, led by Xi Jinping at this time, confronts the question of restraints upon power. Uh, legal and constitutional reforms involve restraints on power. And the questions arise, uh, what are the norms, the rules, the law that should govern, if any, uh, the ruler in the ruler's actions abroad or at home? And then what institutions are there? What people who specialize in applying the norms and the rules? What degree of transparency is there? What opportunity for participation in rulemaking and application is there? Uh, there are many issues, both at home and abroad, that governments have to contend with uh, when we talk about their legal and constitutional powers and the inevitable restraints that many people hope to impose on unfettered power, even in a dictatorship such as that in the People's Republic uh, of China. I think China is at a crossroads right now. Uh, with respect to power and controls over power. I'm not going to talk about China and the world community. We have a panel on that coming along. But I can't help mentioning in the current context that international law, Chinese attitude and practice of international law, confronts the same question that the Chinese legal system at home domestically confronts. When we hear about the South China Sea, for example, and the refusal of the People's Republic of China so far to take part in the arbitration against it brought by the Philippines in an effort to resolve their dispute over the South China Sea peacefully, this raises a question of attitudes toward law. China took an active part in the negotiation of the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it ratified it. And now it seems to be thumbing its nose at the rules that would require China to take its legal arguments before an impartial, independent panel of experts authorized by UNCLOS. But let's talk about the domestic law because that's what people are principally uh, interested in. In China, as you know, the first three decades of the People's Republic from 1949 to 79 were a legal disaster. Uh, the movement of Chairman Mao in the early 50s, while imposing political controls uh, on the country, to import the Soviet legal model proved a failure by 1957. Uh, Chairman Mao grew impatient with the Soviet legal system, which was a socialist version of a Western uh, legal system, continental European Western legal system. Uh, the anti-rightist movement of 1957, 58, 59, and the Great Leap Forward, which followed it immediately, and the Cultural Revolution, which started in 66, demolished any attempt at a formal legal system, Soviet or otherwise. And so, at the demise of the good chairman, 
when Deng Xiaoping decided to change the country's political and economic course domestically and internationally. What we witnessed there was law reform in the form of importing again, reviving the Soviet legal model. But China wasn't content simply blindly to import it, but Deng built upon it and opened China to Western legal values and practices to a considerable extent. And what we have witnessed in China in the period since 1979, despite political change over time, sometimes radical repression, is the construction of what has to be seen as an impressive legal system. Uh, the Chinese have now built up uh, a large body of legislation on most subjects and created very early an environment to attract foreign investment, trade, technology, import, etc. They also have built up the institutions and the personnel to staff those institutions for applying this new body of almost comprehensive uh, legislation. Uh, what we have seen in institutions is a resurrection of the court system, of the prosecutors, the procuracy system, of the legal profession, which has developed from a Soviet-style legal profession to more of a Western-style uh, huge number of lawyers now, as well as judges and prosecutors. There are probably something like 200,000 judges, a similar number of prosecutors, a huge number of legal administrators in the Ministry of Justice and other relevant government agencies at the national level as well as the local levels. And you have now perhaps 250,000 lawyers and a highly developed system of legal education. When I first visited China in 1972, there was no legal education really going on because of the Cultural Revolution. And even in 1979, when I lived there for a couple of years to train legal officials at the invitation of the Beijing city government, there were only a few law schools in the whole country. Now there are almost 700. Too many, perhaps, to adequately staff it with good teachers. But that legal education now is largely Western or at least it has been until very recently. And what we have found now is that every year on the national bar examination, you have several hundred thousand people taking the bar. So even in the police, we find a buildup of legal departments. And every business, state-owned enterprise or entrepreneurial enterprise not involving the state, they have to have lawyers, they have to have legal training, they have to take account of contracts and dispute resolution. So this is an impressive structure uh, in 36 years. And the problem confronting China today is, can it go on from there to build what we would recognize in the West as a more predictable, uh, reliable, uh, independent legal system. Uh, this is a big challenge. It will have an impact on China's increasingly modern economy and the speed and efficiency of its progress. It will have a big impact on social relations in China and the satisfaction of the people Unfortunately, uh, although the system now handles 14 million cases, a huge caseload, roughly 13 million of those involve civil and commercial disputes. But there's also a small number, relatively speaking, 
of administrative law questions where people bring suits against the state. And of course, criminal justice in China is maybe its best known aspect and its most troublesome in terms of trying to develop China's reputation for soft power because the criminal justice system has often revealed defects in the system. There's a huge amount of dissatisfaction in China uh, with the legal system today. Uh, people realize that the local courts are shot full of corruption. Uh, they have to deal with very strong local protectionism that makes the courts less open to fair adjudication for interests that come from outside their immediate area. Guanxi is the biggest problem, perhaps. Uh, relationships, friends, whom did you go to high school with? Who's your cousin? Who's a friend of a friend? That often undermines the fair adjudication of cases. And of course, political interference is very prominent, uh, often for political authorized reasons, authorized by the party, but sometimes the political figures in a community, the local government officials, the local party officials, they use their political capacity to adversely affect independent fair judgments. Um, this is one of the main tasks now that Xi Jinping is trying to improve. He's trying to get the local courts to submit reliably to the discipline of the central party authorities. He doesn't want them to be independent of the central government and the party, but he wants to stop all these adverse local influences that distort local judgments. This is uh, a, big, a big challenge, and we don't know how uh, it's going to work out. But there is great public dissatisfaction, and the courts often are told not to accept sensitive, important cases. I hope that there is a trend underway now, increasingly, to open the courts to handle questions that otherwise will be handled in the streets or in other ways that will create further social discord in a country that's preoccupied uh, with the need for uh, stability. And I should also tell you that there's a lot of dissatisfaction within the ranks of the legal system. The very success of over three decades of legal education and practice has created a large number of people, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, legal scholars, uh, etc., who want to see a real legal system, not one that has the appearance of a legal system, but that functions increasingly and that takes law reform seriously, not only in enacting new rules, but in implementing them. In China, as many people observe, it's difficult to implement new rules that on their face look desirable, but in practice prove difficult to uh, effectuate. The party and the legal system is a major question for law reform. Uh, the party controls the legal system at every level. The Central Political Legal Commission uh, associated with the party central committee and the Politburo leadership really tells every institution of law in China what to do. But there are questions about how far its reach should go. And there have been some improvements and some efforts to limit party influence over the decision-making in individual cases. This is difficult for outsiders to track. 
there's very low level of transparency. Whether the local party political legal committee is still deciding individual cases in most communities is hard to say. But there are efforts underway, also efforts underway at least to make judges, as I said earlier, more independent of local influences. We don't know uh, how successful uh, this can be. Uh, one area where the party continues to play a very strong role is in criminal justice, as in the current anti-corruption drive. It's the party that's more important than the actual criminal justice system. It's the party discipline and inspection commission that detains many people. And often after many months of incommunicado detention and interrogation decides whether that person should be handed over for prosecution or whether the person should be released or given some lesser punishment than criminal imprisonment. The Discipline Inspection Commissions have committed uh, many violations of due process of law and I think are increasingly under pressure to try to get their own house in order. The fate of people handed over for prosecution by the Discipline Inspection Commission is usually a dim one. Uh, it's a decision tantamount to conviction, although it leaves open the questions of conviction or what charges and what degree of punishment uh, they should have. But again, we don't have enough transparency. Let me say a word about the Constitution. Uh, China is an unusual country in this respect. Uh, it has had several constitutions. Uh, since 1982, the Constitution hasn't been changed radically, but it has been amended in a number of respects, some good respects. But the problem is, what does it mean? Uh, this is a constitution that cannot be enforced in the courts. Attempts have been made to do so, but the party has rejected them. Uh, it's a constitution that, according to its terms, is to be interpreted and applied by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. Occasionally, petitions have been made to try to obtain their interpretation, but they are not eager to undertake this authorized role. As a result, there's no formal, obvious way to enforce the promises of the Constitution. There's no way to appeal to it. It doesn't mean the Constitution is meaningless. It does provide some values. It does have some indirect, sometimes subtle influences on the way intergovernmental questions are handled or even on the way the courts respond to individual claims while not invoking in so many terms the Constitution's words uh, themselves. And of course, it's useful in terms of failure to observe human rights for the people at least to see in the Constitution they are supposed to be guaranteed freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom from arbitrary detention uh, by the police. Uh, these are guarantees that are not lived up to at all. But at least the existence of them helps people see what the future should be. They become standards, goals for the future. I think finally we can say politics continues to be in control in China, as the Chinese say, Zhengzhir Gua Shuai. And this uh, involves theory. There are still many people in the legal system who are influenced explicitly or implicitly by Chairman Mao's famous theory of contradictions that said in the application of law, one has to distinguish between the enemy 
and ourselves, the people. And if someone is not a member of the people, then that person will be dealt with harshly by the system. The problem, of course, is determine who makes the decision, who is the people, who are they, and how is that decided, and is there any review from a political police party determination that someone uh, is an enemy. Chairman Mao's theory, of course, uh, is not the only ideological question. Today, there is an up-to-date struggle over the ideology of constitutionalism, over Chinese law reform generally. Unfortunately, the current leadership of Xi Jinping has rejected and forbidden reference to many of the universal values that China unquestionably accepted uh, under the communist rule in earlier eras. And today, to talk about constitutional reform in the universities and in the academic journals uh, is not necessarily a safe uh, enterprise. To talk about real judicial independence, independence of the party even at the central level, for example, is a forbidden subject. There's a struggle underway. Many legal professionals are very unhappy, but they dare not speak for fear of losing their jobs. And yet many legal professionals are giving up in Beijing, recently 500 judges left their jobs in order to find other work, some as lawyers, some in business, some in academe, doing other things. And this is a crisis uh, for the Chinese uh, legal system. In conclusion, I just want to call attention to this curious situation where the father of Xi Jinping, the famous leader, Xi Zhongxun, who was the top man in law reform from 1981 to 83 in the National People's Congress while he was in the Politburo and serving in other high party posts. He was someone who recognized the importance of freedom of discussion, of allowing people within the party and outside the party to speak freely even if their ideas contradicted the policies, programs, and words of the current leadership of the party. He even wanted to enact a law to protect differing opinions, to protect people against suffering criminal punishment, or being ousted from the party, or otherwise condemned, suffering administrative sanctions, and a whole range of unpleasant consequences if they express disagreement with the leadership. He knew that in order to progress, China had to allow differences of opinion. But today, sadly, his son has rejected that. And that is a major limitation on law reform and certainly constitutional reform in China. Right now, the immediate prospect for significant legal and constitutional reform is very dim, I'm sorry to say. Thank you for listening.